In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the idea that there's a subset of people with schizophrenia or with symptoms that very much look like schizophrenia that have a very good therapeutic response to lithium. This idea is unusual and in some quarters is controversial because lithium is thought to be the treatment of people with bipolar disorder. In fact, the association between lithium and bipolar disorder is so strong and so well established that some may argue that a person thought to have schizophrenia who does respond well to lithium probably was originally misdiagnosed. However, that's not been my experience, and in the experience of several of the clinicians that we consult with, uh, this lithium responsive schizophrenia seems to be a legitimate phenomenon. And it turns out that it's a phenomenon that's actually been observed and described as early as the 1950s, and which was documented in a few papers that appeared in the 1970s and 80s. So in this talk, I'm going to look at some of those data and we'll discuss a bit more about the meaning of those data as well as how they potentially relate to current pharmacotherapy practice in the treatment of schizophrenia. The idea that there might be a form of schizophrenia that responds well to lithium is actually very old. In fact, it was first introduced or suggested to the profession by none other than John Cade, the Australian psychiatrist who first studied the actions of lithium on what was then called manic depression and what is today called bipolar disorder. Cade is best known for introducing the profession to lithium as a treatment for bipolar disorder, but he also did a handful of small studies in which he gave lithium to patients that seemed more likely to fit the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And he claimed that a portion of people with schizophrenia-like symptoms did appear to derive therapeutic benefit from lithium treatment. So almost from the beginning of lithium's medical use in the 20th century, there were reports that it might help a subset of people whose symptoms more closely resemble those of schizophrenia than of bipolar disorder. The suggestion that lithium might be helpful for a subset of people with schizophrenia-like illness is really important. But despite this importance, the question was not really well investigated for the next 20 years. There were a handful of anecdotes that supported that notion, but it wasn't until 1971 when Shopson and colleagues conducted the first controlled study of lithium as a potential treatment for schizophrenia-like symptoms. And in the Shopson study, which was very small, it involved a total of 21 patients. Um, they randomized about half of them to treatment with chlorpromazine, which is a standard antipsychotic medication widely used at that time. And about half of the sample, or 11 patients, were randomized to treatment with lithium. They found that the, the patients treated with chlorpromazine overall had a better response. In fact, in the lithium treatment group, the average scores didn't change, and about half of the patients that were treated seemed to worsen. It's not clear from the report whether they worsened because of some adverse effect of lithium directly or because lithium was simply an ineffective treatment and the natural process of their illness just unfolded and resulted in the clinical worsening. So the first controlled study of lithium as a treatment was negative. Nonetheless, by the end of the 1970s, a group led by Alexander studied 13 patients with schizophrenia, again, a very small group. Uh, to make matters worse, they were people with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder with a variety of, of clinical subtypes. So it was open to a wide range of patients. Despite this limitation, or maybe because of it, there were just over half of the treated patients experienced a very significant reduction in symptoms of psychosis, and the clinical response to lithium was apparent within the first week of treatment. So at the end of the 1970s, we had two reports with contradictory results. The positive finding of the Alexander study in 1979 seems to have inspired Hershowitz and colleagues to undertake their own study, this time again looking at lithium as a monotherapy or as a standalone sole treatment for 
symptoms of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder in a sample of 31 patients. And just as Alexander had noted, there was a subset of that group that seemed to derive a therapeutic benefit from lithium treatment. It wasn't as large as Alexander had found in Hershowitz's study. About one-third of the patients were lithium responders. But also consistent with Alexander's observations, the therapeutic response to lithium appeared within the first week, so it was a rapid onset. Hershowitz and colleagues tried to figure out what characteristics might separate the responders from the non-responders, and they found that it was not whether a person had schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Um, in fact, it was not the predominance of affective symptoms that seemed to have any relationship to lithium response. Rather, lithium responsiveness was associated with clinical characteristics that we typically associate with better prognosis in schizophrenia. Specifically, that the symptoms were relatively acute or sudden in onset, as opposed to a gradual unfolding and worsening over time. The patients that were lithium responders tended as a group to have achieved a higher level of functional or psychological development prior to the onset of their illness, and individuals that were lithium responders seemed to have a shorter, dura shorter duration of psychosis. Later reports would validate these original findings and also add that patients that were lithium responders tended to have a family history of affective illness. And then, in 1984, Zemlin and colleagues conducted their own clinical study of lithium for the treatment of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Like the Hershowitz study, it was very short. It involved just two weeks of treatment. And similar to several of the studies that we've just looked at, lithium was the only medication, so it was a monotherapy. It wasn't added on to some other treatment. And what the investigators found was that just over 40% of the 61 patients in the study um, had a very significant reduction of symptoms. And significant reduction here means greater than 40% decrease in psychosis symptom rating scales within the first two weeks of treatment. Also, in this study, as in previous studies, the, the investigators noticed that the people who were lithium responders tended to respond very quickly. According to Zemlin and colleagues, the response was observed within the first few days of treatment and certainly was um, clinically obvious by the first week. This paper also addressed the common and frequent question, criticism, or concern with this line of investigation, that being that lithium is supposed to be a treatment for bipolar disorder and that the lithium responsive group of schizophrenia or schizoaffective patients probably were individuals that in reality had a unrecognized bipolar disorder. And Zemelin and colleagues observed that, in fact, it was the core symptoms of psychosis. It was hallucinations and delusions that tended to respond first and tended to have the most robust response rather than the mood symptoms. So they argued that rather than having lithium appear to reduce psychosis symptoms by virtue of reducing affective symptom severity. In fact, it was lithium addressing core features of psychosis that made it beneficial. And this is the third paper that we've looked at now in this history of studies that shows that the lithium response is rapid. And Zemlin and colleagues in this paper argued that perhaps we should offer everybody with a first episode of schizophrenia-like psychosis a therapeutic trial of lithium. The rationale being that if the responders are going to respond rapidly, we may learn who is going to be a lithium responder within the first week of treatment. And if we have identified pharmacologically the subset of patients with lithium responsive schizophrenia, we might be able to offer them um, an alternative to traditional antipsychotic medications. It's a reasonable argument, but unfortunately, as we'll find out soon, one that was never really followed up in any systematic way. And you will have noticed now that in the last three studies we've looked at, there was consistently a finding that a portion of people with schizophrenia-like illness derived therapeutic benefit from lithium. Certainly raises the possibility that within schizophrenia, 
are multiple kinds of illness, and one of those illnesses that gets called schizophrenia is a lithium responsive entity. It also raises the question what portion of people diagnosed with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder will have this lithium responsive subtype of condition. And the answer to that question from existing studies could range from a low of 15% to a high of 53%. So this is a massive range. It has a very wide confidence interval. And this is because there is only a small number of studies, and each of those studies had a small number of individuals. So to summarize at this point, in my view, there probably is a subset of people with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder who will be lithium responders but we really have no idea exactly the size of that proportion. I would suggest, from my experience, it may be more like 15% or a lower range, because if lithium responsiveness was all that common, I think we would all know about it by now. And that last point that I just made is important, so I'll emphasize that again. The number of studies that point to lithium responsive schizophrenia are pretty small in number. Not only that, but they as a group are lacking in certain design elements which give high confidence to the conclusions. Among them, um, some studies are anecdotal or open label, other studies are run against no placebo group, and the studies in general have relatively low sample size. So these are all significant limitations which were noted in the Cochrane Review of 2015, authored by Stefan Leucht and colleagues. In the Cochrane Review, they identified only studies, they considered only studies in which lithium was run against some other treatment, either against a placebo or against some other active drug, or when lithium was given as an add-on medicine um, in a placebo-controlled fashion. There were not a lot of studies that met those criteria, and only two of them were of the nature that we explored earlier, lithium as a monotherapy in the treatment of schizophrenia or schizophrenia-like psychosis. Overall, considering all work that was, that was reviewed in the Cochrane Review study, there was no signal that lithium was better than placebo treatment or better than comparator treatments. However, that Cochrane Review only could find two studies in which lithium was given as a monotherapy versus a placebo. Incidentally, in both of those studies, lithium appeared to have um, better overall performance than the placebo did. But that aside, the point is that we don't have a lot of really strong data to answer the question one way or the other. I should also make mention of some of the side effects and risks associated with lithium. Although lithium might have therapeutic advantages for a select subset of people with schizophrenia-like psychosis, in other words, it might benefit a small number of individuals with schizophrenia for whom standard antipsychotic medications don't work, or although lithium might have a side effect profile that some individuals might see as strongly preferable to the side effect profile of antipsychotic medications, lithium is nonetheless a medicine that comes with its own set of side effects and risks. As most clinicians will be aware, lithium has a narrow therapeutic window, meaning that the difference between drug levels that are therapeutic and drug levels at which significant side effects or toxicity can emerge is not a very large ratio. We would like it to see, we would like it to be much larger for most drugs. Lithium doesn't offer that. Not only does it have a narrow therapeutic window, but there are also some potentially dangerous interactions with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or diuretics, agents which are commonly prescribed. In both cases, medications, uh, NSAID medications or diuretics, can cause lithium levels to rise to the point that they exceed therapeutic values and enter ranges where they can create side effects or toxicity. And also there's the concern that when lithium is prescribed with antipsychotic medications, some people may begin to experience signs of an acute confusional state that resembles encephalopathy. And also with lithium during long-term treatment, there's a risk of impairing thyroid function or kidney function. So although there are certainly many people who can take lithium successfully and with minimal side effects, 
and there are some people for whom lithium is an amazingly helpful medicine, it is, like everything else, not the right medicine for everybody. So I think it's important to point out, since I am highlighting potential advantages of lithium, that, like everything, it comes with its own set of risks. So let's conclude what we think we know. We started off asking a question about whether lithium might be an effective treatment for at least a portion of people with symptoms that more closely resemble schizophrenia than anything else. And there certainly does seem to be some evidence to support this idea. However, most of the evidence that supports it consists of clinical experience, anecdotal case reports, and a handful of very small and pretty old clinical studies that fall fairly far short of modern standards for study quality. Nonetheless, it's been my experience, and, and it's been the experience of some people that I consult with, that lithium-responding schizophrenia probab probably is a legitimate entity. And it's unfortunate that the studies that were done in the 70s and the 80s basically just stopped. These studies raised extremely interesting and important questions about the nature of the schizophrenia diagnosis, and these studies gave leads for more diverse treatment options, and it certainly would be useful to have more options in place in clinical practice. So even though these questions are important and remain important, they are inadequately answered. I wish I could have more clear guidance for somebody about how to think about or incorporate this data into clinical practice, or even to say whether it ought to be included in one's clinical practice. But I hope that by covering this history, I will at least have given you some interesting and worthwhile things to think about. And here, for those who are interested, are the full citations for the papers that I talked about in this study. I'll leave this up for a second in case you want to pause the screen and take notes.